Good morning, this is Robin Hogue of Skyline Presbyterian Church. Thank you for experimenting with us as we learn how to worship uh, through online streaming. Because we don't have visuals for you, my encouragement to you, invitation, is that you choose right now uh, something that you want to look at while you join us in worship. Maybe it's a picture window. Maybe it's a piece of art. Maybe you'd like to light a candle to remind you of Christ's presence with you. Do something that helps you center and be present to God, who is already present with you. Good morning. Thank you for choosing to worship together even when we can't gather in person. It's March 22nd and the fourth Sunday in Lent and we're in a series we're calling The Wilderness. It's a series that's ringing true for most of us. For the wilderness is a place where things don't look familiar and resources appear to be scarce. And it's true for us in this novel coronavirus season that we're in. Even in the midst of all these challenges, there have been wonderful gifts and opportunities. People are stepping up, stepping forward, connecting with each other, giving phone calls. I'm hearing stories of how people have heard from friends and neighbors that they haven't, uh, they haven't had recent connection until now. So thank you for that. Keep it up. Keep it up. And as a way to be in connection with the church, there's an announcement here. It's brought forward from the Walsh family, and it comes from Christopher and Alexander. Thanks, guys. Good morning. We are the Walsh brothers, and we would like you to know that we are here for you. If there's anything you'd need delivered to your house, all you have to do is call your deacons, and we can deliver it right to your front doorstep. Remember, we're praying for you. Stay healthy. Thank you. Please pray with me. Loving God, we thank you for the gift of another day. We thank you that you are with us, whether we are meeting in homes or apartments or scattered across the Puget Sound, we thank you. We ask that you would receive our prayer. You would receive our praise. We ask that you would receive our open hearts and minds, that you would speak into them, that we might be changed more and more like Jesus so that we could serve you in the world. Amen. Thank you. I'm going to invite Bob Wallace to join me that together we will share a responsive reading. Thank you, Bob. Jesus met the leper in his pain. And Jesus met the Samaritan woman in her isolation. Jesus met the crowds at the edge of the sea. Jesus met the blind man at the city gate. So with confidence we declare, Jesus meets us here. We too are hurting and the bleeding. We too are the broken and blind. Jesus meets our scars, our fears, our prayers, and our dreams. We are welcome here. All are welcome here. If you're blessed to be worshiping this morning with someone near you, I'd like you to turn to them and offer the peace of Christ to them. It's very simple. You look someone in the eye and say, peace of Christ be with you. And the person responds, and also with you. So to my church, the peace of Christ be with you. And I know you've responded back. Thank you. Thank you and praise to God. We're going to thank Carla Epperson now, who's going to bring a piano solo for us. The piece is entitled, The Lord's My Shepherd. 
from the 23rd Psalm. Thank you, Carla. Please join your hearts with mine as we engage in the responsive prayer of confession. Jesus of Nazareth, we marvel at the biblical record of your healing the blind. You are constantly opening people's eyes. Today we confess to you and to one another that we often choose to keep our eyes closed. We turn away from injustice in our world, worried that you might ask us to work for change. We close our eyes to our privilege because the truth is uncomfortable. We avoid eye contact with those who are suffering in our attempt to avoid identifying with their pain. Forgive us for failing to be your people in our neighborhoods and cities. Thank you. That was Ed Tromp leading us in the prayer of confession. Would you please continue in personal and silent prayer? All loving God, we thank you that these words have become our own, that we found our lives reflected in this prayer. We have turned a blind eye to those who are suffering we have avoided seeing you and your call upon our lives. And so we ask your forgiveness. And in Jesus Christ, we ask that you would help us to be made whole. Amen. Friends, there is good news. Our deepest needs have been met by God through Jesus Christ. Through Christ, our sins have been forgiven. Receive the good news. There is life in it for you and through you for others. Amen. As part of Skyline, I invite the younger people to join me. They usually come and sit with me up front in our sanctuary, and so I'd like you in your imaginations now to do that for our time together. So thank you. And to our young people, I've got a question for you. Can you remember a time when you were blindfolded for a game? Maybe it was pin the tail on the donkey and a birthday party or some version of a game where you couldn't see until it was time to see. Maybe, like me, you took a trust walk. Now, a trust walk is when somebody has put a blindfold on you, made sure that you couldn't see, and then they lead you around an obstacle course, a place that's not familiar to you. And if you're like me, you, you tend to walk differently, not quite sure how to trust the ground beneath your feet, and if you're like me, your arms are sticking out in case you bump into something that it would touch your fingertips first instead of smacking right into it with your full face. Everything changes if you are a sighted person like me and then suddenly you can't see. And the gospel story that I'm going to read for us out of the book of John has to do with a guy that was born blind. He didn't get a blindfold put on him later in life, he didn't get to see from the very beginning. And then everything changed for him when Jesus brought his healing. Everything can change for us too when Jesus comes into our lives. So I pray that when we feel like we can't see where we're going, that we will turn to Jesus and ask him to show us the way. Let's pray together. God, I thank you so much for our young boys and girls. I thank you for each one of our teens. And I pray that you would keep them close to you and you would keep them free from fear, that you would keep their minds and hearts and bodies strong. 
and you would let them know that you are with them always. Amen. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Thank you. That was Bob Wallace bringing a beautiful version of the 23rd Psalm. We continue with our Bible reading this time in the New Testament in John's Gospel in the ninth chapter. Listen now for the word of God to you. As Jesus went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in him. As long as it's day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night's coming when no one can work. While I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. And after saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. And the word Siloam means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, Isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, No, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes opened, they asked. And he replied, The man they called Jesus, he made some mud and put it in my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash, so I went and washed, and then I could see. Where is this man, they asked him. I don't know, he said. They brought him to the Pharisees, and now on, this was on the day which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes. It was a Sabbath. And therefore the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, How can a sinner perform such signs? So they were divided then they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. And the man replied, well, he is a prophet. They still did not believe that he'd been blind and received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son, they asked? Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it that he can now see? We know he's our son, the parents answered. And we know he was born blind, but how he can see now or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who already had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah would be excommunicated from the synagogue. That was why his parents said, well, ask him. He's of age. So the second time, they summoned the man. Give glory to God by telling the truth. We know this man is a sinner. And the man replied, whether Jesus is a sinner or not, I do not know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. And then they asked him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And he answered, I've told you already and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Oh, do you want to become his disciples too? Then they hurled insults at him. You are this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. The man answered, now that's remarkable. 
You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. To this they replied, you were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. Jesus heard that they'd thrown him out. And when he found the man, Jesus said, do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I may believe in him. And Jesus said, you have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking to you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. This story is filled with strange disruptions. Jesus and the disciples are walking along when Jesus sees a man born blind begging. Now, I love the fact that he never referred to the man as the blind man. He's always seen first as a man, and P.S., he happened to have been born blind. The disciples, apparently right in front of this guy, who we imagine can hear very well, he is not deaf, They ask, who sinned, this guy or his parents? We think this is an outrageous question to ask. But it's a familiar question, right? We ask, why did this happen to me? What did I do wrong, Lord? There seem no easy answers to it. Jesus says, it's no one's fault. It's not the man's parents' fault, and it's not the man's fault. It's nothing that they did wrong or that he did wrong. I mean, how could he do anything wrong while he's in the womb? Now, in my time with our young disciples, I asked them to remember a time when they were blindfolded. And everything, therefore, felt different if you were a sighted person like I am. Well, when I was a kid, maybe 10 or so, I got to visit an underground mine. And what I remember connected with this story in John is how I felt when the guide turned off the lights. And when that happens, you are aware only of yourself, this clammy humidity on your skin that occurs far underground when there's no movement of air, hearing or feeling your own heartbeat. You can no longer see anyone else in the group. You can't even see your own hand just an inch in front of your own nose. You feel alone. You alone are important. There is no larger picture. You are focused on the moment, on safety. Now, this may sound a little dramatic, But if you've ever been in a mine like I have without light, you know I'm telling you the truth. Now, on the other hand, when our Lord gives us sight, our our scope enlarges. We see other people. Community becomes possible. You step with confidence into the unknown. You comprehend the landscape. You see a bigger picture. It's not automatic. We're always, always offered a choice. When the religious leaders ask for the fifth time a question using the word how, how did you open your eyes? How did he open your eyes? We see that they're fixated on the method rather than going to the deeper question of who is this healer? The religious leaders even turn against the now sighted man with disgust that he, in their estimation, is still a sinner and he would deign to tell them how to think about Jesus. You can almost smell the excessive vanity dripping off those affronted, powerful types. We know them in our own time. They often get caught offending in just this way they accuse others of sinning. Well, did you notice that Jesus is absent most of this story? It's kind of a curious thing. He's there in the beginning and heals the man. And he's there at the end when the man will again be denied the dignity and humanity of community when he's thrown out of the synagogue. Jesus' absence for most of the story gives the threatened people time to try to find someone they can blame. They do this rather than give Jesus the credit for the good gift he has brought. 
And when Jesus does appear, he perfectly depicts in a double meaning the point of his healing. I came into this world so that those who do not see may see. When Jesus returns to the story at the end, he pulls out from God's word the deeper meaning of having vision. He enlarges the meaning of light that, gives, that God gives so that it becomes a kind of interior seeing. Having vision becomes a way to connect with others. A healed man doesn't get caught up in the befuddling questions of the religious leaders like whether Jesus is a sinner. The healed man says what he knows to be the flat truth. Jesus healed me. And he's gutsy. He sounds exasperated at the religious leaders when they want to hear it again. He says, I've told you already and you would not listen. His vision has brought him clarity, a kind of clarity we might all admire because vision brings wisdom. This story has all the people that we can find in any group. It's got the self-righteous, the powerful. It's got the crowd who wants to watch. It's got the ones who want to turn a blind eye. It's got the ones who try to avoid getting involved. The only one who truly receives light is the one born blind. He's the only one who's healed. He's the only one who names Jesus appropriately. The story of the blind man's healing in John comes in three movements. Jesus comes and heals a man born blind. Everybody in this is in a tizzy trying to figure out what happened. Jesus comes again to the healed man when the man is isolated again from community. Jesus comes, there's conflict, and Jesus comes to restore community. This movement mirrors our world in every age. Jesus came. We wonder what happened and we argue about it. And Jesus comes to us again and again and again to bring healing. No one will remain unaffected by this novel coronavirus. How we need Jesus to come again with healing. Schools have moved online or have closed for now. Those who are able to do so are shifting to work from home. Friday was the first day of spring, but many of the markers of March are upended. There's no March Madness basketball or weekly worship gathered together, or spring break trips. More painfully, visiting loved ones in care facilities and hospitals is limited, in some cases prohibited. Whole grocery store aisles are rendered empty by those who are able to stock up on paper products and bleach and hand sanitizer. Those already on edge are being pushed closer to falling off. Families experiencing food insecurity stress about what it will mean when the schools close and the source of their children's breakfast and lunch has gone with it. I wonder, as we shelter in place and find everyday routines disrupted as a result of the spreading COVID-19, I wonder how we will react in this crisis. I wonder what we will assume and how will Jesus seek to reveal himself, correct our wrong understandings and bring new sight. I'm thinking this crisis might, just might, help us foster greater compassion, help us with solidarity across borders, and it might even invite us to live into wider inclusion. We, like Jesus' disciples, may have been tempted to look at people if we saw them at all and assume their plight was somehow their own fault. If we were blind to this truth before, this pandemic might help us to see it now. In the wake of travel bans and school and business closures, event cancellations and market decline, will our eyes be opened? Can this crisis become an occasion for our belief in Jesus to alter not only our understanding of others, but our treatment of them? Can this anxious season become an occasion to reveal the work of God in us and among us and through us? It will always remain our choice. 
We can choose to miss the opportunity to see others with new eyes, but why would we? Thank you for that beautiful offering of music. Let's continue to offer ourselves in prayer. Please join me. Loving God, we come before you grateful that you have a living word for us. We are so grateful that you are at work. And so we lift to you those who are needing your healing. We ask that you would sustain our first responders, that you would help our communities choose wisdom, to choose love, over, love of others over self. Remove our blindness, Lord. Help us to face realities and be courageous with our love, even when it means limiting our own freedoms in order to preserve the life of others. As fear grips our communities, Lord, help us to choose love. Help us to continue to find ways to wrap our arms around each other when we cannot physically be together. Help us to find ways to be the loving embrace of God to our neighbors to our world. Amen. It's good to be with you in my heart, as I imagine worshiping with you. Please receive now the blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Until we can be together again. Peace be with you.